on what uh, we believe, what we believe from the Word of God. Um, next week, we'll be studying on the Holy Spirit, and that ought to be a tremendous study. The Holy Bible was written by men, supernaturally inspired, that it has truth without any admixture of error for its matter, and therefore is and shall remain to the end of the age the only complete and final revelation of the will of God to man, the true center of Christian unity and the supreme standard by which all human conduct, creeds, and opinions should be tried. Now, I like that uh, word final. Of course, you might want to underline some different words or some things that stand out to you as you go through there. But it's the final revelation of God as well. And, uh, you know, there's been some religions who have written other books since the Bible. And, uh, matter of fact, uh, many of them claim that, it's, that they're just as much inspired as the Word of God. But according to what we believe, uh, we believe what, how John closed off the book of Revelation. That we're not to add to and we're not to take away from the Word of God. I believe that was not only applicable of Revelation, but I believe it's applicable of the whole uh, Word of God. Now, as we look at our terms, we have two terms here, the Holy Bible and inspiration. Now, by the Holy Bible, we mean that collection of 66 books from Genesis to Revelation, which is originally written does not only contain and convey the Word of God, but is the very Word of God. And there are those who say the Bible's a wonderful book, and they say it contains the Word of God. And it might sound good at first, but better check it out, because if it only contains the Word of God, that means that there might be some of it that isn't the Word of God. We believe that it is the very Word of God, word for word, and uh, every jot and every tittle, as Jesus said. Uh, every bit of it is the Word of God. It's the Holy Bible. Now this is where many, why, why there is so much modernism and so much liberalism and so much departing from the faith is because uh, many uh, denominations, many seminaries, many Bible schools have let down on this very doctrine. And if you let down on this doctrine, then pretty soon you won't believe in the virgin birth. You, you, you won't believe in a lot of things that the Bible teaches. This is our foundation. The Holy Scriptures. It is the Holy Bible. Like the colored fellow down south said, he said, I believe every word of it's inspired, even the cover where it says Holy Bible. And uh, it is the Holy Bible. It's the Word, the very Word of God. Now, by the word inspiration, secondly, we mean that the books of the Bible were written by holy men of old as they were moved by the Holy Spirit in such a definite way that their writings were supernaturally and verbally inspired and free from error as no other writings have ever been or ever will be inspired. And there are religions, there are those who believe that uh, the Bible is no more inspired than any other religious book. I mean, they actually say this. But we believe that this it's the only book like it. Now, I have many other books in my library, but uh, many of them have dust gathering on because uh, I just hardly ever get time to open it. But I'll tell you one thing, I hope that the Bible never gets dust on it. That's the one I want to make sure I keep in. This is the greatest library of all. And uh, if, if a man would ignore the Bible to read other books, he's asking for trouble. I know some fellows, they, they know, know Spurgeon's sermons better than they do the Word of God. And even though C.H. Spurgeon was a great preacher of many years ago, his writings were not inspired like the Word of God, you see. The Bible is the inspired, very Word of God. And Spurgeon would have been, would have been the first one to tell you exactly that. Matter of fact, I, I know even some preachers, that they, that's where they get their sermons, from other men like that. And some of them have even getting, gotten into trouble with their churches because all they did was preach someone else. And we've got to be ourselves. That's one of the greatest rules, uh, greatest teachings of all is we must be ourselves. Uh, God can give us the word to speak, can't he? So here we have the word of God. Now let's look at uh, 2 Peter chapter 1. 2 Peter chapter 1. The second epistle. And of course an epistle is not the wife of an apostle. <laughs> but the, an epistle is what? What is it? Does anybody know what an epistle is? What does the epistle mean? The word epistle mean? All right. Letter. Amen. Letter fly, right? No, not really, but it means a letter, just like you'd write a letter to somebody. That's what this was. Peter's uh, letters or epistles, John's letters or epistles. And here in 2 Peter 1, notice what it says in verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy. 
Whereunto ye do well that ye take heed as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star rise in your hearts. Knowing this first, and this is what we've got to know first, that no prophecy of the Scripture is of any private interpretation. Now that simply means that we cannot take one verse all by itself and interpret it by itself privately. We must take the rest of the Scripture and uh, shine the, the light on it. This is one of the most important rules of Bible study is to always study the text in the light of the context. Read the rest of the chapter and even the chapters before and after and uh, get familiar with who wrote it and, and who they were writing to and, and the different circumstances and that will help you to understand what they mean. No scripture is of any, of any private interpretation. The best commentary on the Bible is what? The Bible. Amen. Uh, and it would be better to leave all the other books untouched and to, and to really stay in the Word of God. Now, there are other books that will be helpful, yes. But don't ever put them alongside the Word of God. They're not nearly as important as the Word of God. They can only be a help. But the Word of God is the very God-breathed Word of, of God. And in verse 21, For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God. And no, notice that. It's holy men of God. God uses men who are holy. And I think that's important to realize. That if we want to be used of God, we must have a holy life. Uh, we need to uh, be a separate people. And then he said, They spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Now these were holy men. They were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit is the one who actually wrote the Word of God. I mean, he used men, yes. But even today, God uses men. But did you know God could still, uh, if, he, if he wanted to, he could get along without us, right? Uh, just like the offering. We say, well, we need the offering. Well... Humanly speaking, we do, but God doesn't really need the offering at all. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. You see, he, he owns everything already, and he can get along without it, and yet he wants to bless us by our obedience in giving. So we need the blessing. <laughs> We're the ones that need to give, much more than he needs the money, you see. And here he says, holy men. And today God uses human instrumentality. There's only one way to get people saved, and that's by men going out and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the way to get people saved. That's God's way. And yet he could have designed it to be some other way. He could have preached it in the clouds. He could have sent angels. He could have done it so many different ways. But he, he chose to use human instruments like you and like me. And we're the ones that get the blessings for it. And so he uses holy men. Now God actually wrote the word, but he, he worked through human instrumentality. Now there's a, a term, the verbal plenary inspiration of the word of God. I remember this from Bible school. Um, and all that simply means the verbal, meaning that God inspired every word, not just the thoughts and so on. And yet, we don't understand it completely, but God used the personality of each individual. In other words, if you read the, read the writings of Paul, it's different from the writings of Peter. Peter was an uneducated man. He was a fisherman, a worker. And Paul was a very educated man. He studied at the feet of Gamaliel. So they're different men, and yet they were both used of God and were inspired of God to write. And so God used their personality. He didn't use them as a robot, but he, he, he spoke through their personality as well. And yet every word is inspired of God. Thank God for that truth. Now, uh, let's look at uh, 2 Timothy 3. Of course, this is probably uh, one of the most familiar scriptures concerning the inspiration of the, of the Word of God. Um, we want uh, 2 Peter 3. And we notice in verse 15, here, of course, Paul is writing to Timothy. And he says in that, From a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So the Bible is what makes us wise unto salvation. No one can be saved without the Word of God. They must hear the Word of God. Romans 10 tells us that, and we aren't going to take the time to, to look at all of these scriptures that we have on our lesson outline. We may look at Romans 10 again but uh, in a little bit. But uh, the Bible is the only way you can be saved is by hearing the Word of God. Now, the track ministry has been blessed of the Lord. Um, and, and it's wonderful. And if there's not an opportunity to speak to somebody, it's better to leave a track than not to say anything at all. And like at uh, the, the, the restaurant or at the, uh, at the supermarket, rather than trying to take people away from their job and getting them in trouble with their supervisor, I think it's more wise to give them a track than to try to witness to them when they're on the job. And it'd be better to make an appointment to go back and talk to them later than to, to get them in trouble with their supervisor at work. But the track ministry has been used of the Lord, and that's the Word of God. When somebody reads the track, if they'll read it, the, 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 that's the Word of God. 
And, uh, of course, there's other ways. The radio, the television, and different medias. God is blessed. But God has blessed nothing any more than when, when we just simply get up and preach the Word of God. And when we go to an individual and we preach the Word of God, we announce. The word preach means to, in, in, in Mark 16, 15, talking about announcing the Word of God. We preach it and we give it to somebody. And so here it says that, that the Holy Scriptures are able to make thee wise unto salvation. It's not important what I think or what my opinion is. That, that doesn't make any difference, really. But what God says, that makes the whole difference. And what I need to do is give people the Word of God. And their argument is not with me. Their argument is with God. And then in verse 16, all Scripture. Now notice the word all, A-L-L. That's the biggest word in the English language, I think. It, it just means simply what it says. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Now, some of the new versions, and one reason I don't like many of these versions and, and paraphrases and all of that is because they've taken away. Now, the uh, American standard version of 1901. I remember one time I knew some fundamental preachers that said, boy, that was the best version. You know, it's closest to the original Greek. But this is one reason I, I don't believe that it is, is because in this verse, it says every scripture that is given by inspiration of God. And I have a copy of it down in my office. And I, I had a Greek teacher at Pillsbury Baptist Bible College by the name of uh, John, I think his name was John, anyway, it's Barnes, his last name was Barnes. And he he was quite an educated man in Greek, and he said that in the original it does not say that. It says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, just like the King James Version says it. And he had it studied out to the T, and he really knew. Uh, and so i tell you what, the, the closest version that I, I believe, and uh, we ought to just take it, I believe God has given us the King James Version, and, and I believe we ought to just stay with it. The only thing you can gain by studying all these other things is confusion. And that's not what I call a gain. <laughs> confusion. And so um, I believe that if we, with the help of God and so on, we can learn and we can understand uh, this authorized version which we have with us even today. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Every bit of the Word of God. Now, going back to that, what the other version says, every Scripture that is given by inspiration of God. See, right there it leaves, leaves an opening saying that some of it might not be inspired of God. But every Scripture that is inspired of God, well, that's profitable. So right there, it leaves a door open for, for people to say, well, maybe some of it is and some of it isn't. But here, it doesn't leave a door open. It just says all of it is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine. What is doctrine? <clears throat> what is doctrine? Is, is this a doctrine, the, the Scriptures that we're studying this morning? Shake your head. Is it a doctrine or not? Amen, it is, isn't it? Last week was a doctrine of the true God. Next week's a doctrine, the Holy Spirit. What we believe, that's doctrine, isn't it? That's what we stand on. And, of course, uh, without knowing, without getting this settled first about the Holy Scriptures, well, then all the other doctrines, you see, we need to make sure we have a good foundation before we, then that's what we base on what we believe the Holy Spirit, what we believe about all the other doctrines once we get this settled. But we have to know for sure and settle, first of all, that this is the inspired Word of God completely. And it says it's profitable also for reproof. Now, sometimes that doesn't seem profitable when you get like some cold water thrown in your face and you're reproved by the Word of God. And you know good and well you're doing wrong and the Word of God has reproved you for it. Sometimes that doesn't seem profitable, but it is. It may not seem profitable when you pick up your child and your child to your child. It may not seem profitable when you spank them. But it is, you see. Discipline is profitable. So for reproof, for correction, when we're corrected in the things that we believe, and God help us not to be proud. God help us to when we see that we're wrong, to, to take the correction of the Word of God gracefully and in the Lord. And here it says, for instruction in righteousness. We're instructed in righteousness by the Word of God. Why? That the man of God may be perfect or complete. This is what it means. It doesn't mean sinlessly perfect. It means that we have everything we need. Everything we need is right here in the Word of God. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You see, uh, there's no excuse for us not living a victorious Christian life because we have everything we need right here in the Word of God. And the only reason we don't have the victory is because we aren't taking the whole Word of God and believing it and studying it and applying it to our own heart and to our life. All right? Now, um, we, let's look at Romans 10. We mentioned that a little while ago, and I think it'd be good just to look at it briefly. Romans 10, and we see in verse uh, 13, it says, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, let's look at verse 14, please, of Romans 10. There's a question here, actually a threefold question, I think it is. It says... Uh, First of all, how, sh how then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? So if somebody didn't believe on him, how can they call on him? Secondly, uh, how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? If they haven't heard about him, how can they believe in him? And how shall they hear without a preacher? 
So there's got to be a preacher to, to give the word. And then the fourth question is for, in verse 15, how shall they preach except they be seen? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the, what? Gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. The gospel is the good news of salvation. And here it says the gospel of peace brings peace to the human heart when we believe and we, when we receive the gospel of Jesus Christ. So right here, it brings out the fact the only way a person can be saved is when someone's preached the Word of God unto them. All right, now, let's go to Psalms 119 for a moment. We're just going to look at several verses quickly. Uh, I think that Psalms 119 is one of the most wonderful chapters in all the Bible, not only because it's a lengthy chapter, which it is the longest chapter in the Bible, but because it's... Its entire context is concerning the Word of God. It's interesting to me to note that the longest chapter in the Bible deals with the Bible itself. That God took, and, and He made that longest chapter, uh, the, the one that deals with the Word of God. Of course, we realize that in, in 1611, when they um, brought the original over into the King James Version or into the authorized version we have, that the chapters weren't even there. But I believe God watched over it and protected as they translated it and uh, made sure that it came out this way. I really do. Uh, we find here, uh, it says, Blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the Lord. Verse 9, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way? How? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Verse 16, I will delight myself in thy statutes. I will not forget thy word. 18, Open thou mine eyes that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. And how we need to have our eyes opened by the, by the power of the Holy Spirit and, and His teaching ministry. Verse 27, Make me to understand the way of thy precepts, so shall I talk of thy wondrous works. And then in 30, I have chosen the way of the truth. Uh, verse 33, Teach me, O Lord, the way of thy statutes, and I shall keep it unto the end. Verse uh, uh, 40, Behold, I have longed after thy precepts, quicken me in thy righteousness. Now, if we had time, we could read the entire chapter, and you'd find almost every verse mentions the law or the word of God in some way. Verse 42, So shall I have wherewith to answer him that reproacheth me, for I trust in thy word. 45, and I will walk at liberty, for I seek thy precepts. The word of God sets us free, you see. Verse 50, this is my comfort and my affliction, for thy word hath quickened me, and quickened means to be made alive. Verse 63, I am companion or friend, that means, of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Now really, you can't be a, a close companion or a friend of someone unless they keep the, the word of God. Now I have many acquaintances, even out in the world, people that aren't saved. But I really can't have a close friend unless they keep the Word of God. Unless they're a child of God and they keep the Word of God. My fellowship depends on whether they and myself are keeping the Word of God, you see. And there are those that even profess the name of the Lord that I can't have real fellowship with at all because they're uh, disobedient to the Lord or they've, uh, they're, they're backslidden or something like this. Verse 71, It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Have you ever thought about that? One reason why we have trials and persecution and problems is so we can learn the Word of God. We really couldn't learn it unless we had some of those. We, we are, we're to become like the image of Christ, and, and the only way we can have that is to go through a few of the things that uh, make us more like Him, you see. Hard times. Isn't that right? That's, uh, sometimes it's a lonely time, but yet that's how we learn the Word of God. Verse 74, They that fear thee will be glad when they see me, because I have hoped in thy word. 77, Let thy tender mercies come unto me, that I may live, for thy law is my delight. The Word of God is my delight. 81, My soul fainteth for thy salvation, for, but I hope in thy word. 88, quicken me after thy loving kindness, so shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. See, the word of God is, is the mouth of God. I mean, the word is coming from God's mouth. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Verse 89, do you think the word of God's ever going to change? A lot of people say it has. A lot of people say that it's not the same today as it was before. Why, according to the word of God, it is. It's settled in heaven. How long? Forever. And there's another verse that says, let every man, let God be true, but every man a liar. So if somebody disagrees with God, guess who moved? Guess who's wrong? It isn't God. And some folks have the idea that God is old and He's some old man in the sky with a long gray beard and He's just barely getting around nowadays. But how untrue that is. That doesn't line up with the Word of God at all. God's just as powerful now as ever. His Word is just as true as ever and it's just as powerful. 97, O how love I thy, or I thy law, it is my meditation all the day. 103, how sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. You ever had something you just, just wanted to keep tasting like honey? That's, that's, uh, I like honey myself. I mean, it really tastes good. And, and you just enjoy it. 
Some things you eat because you really need it. You know, it's good for your health, your diet. But other things you eat because you enjoy it. Like homemade ice cream and a few things like that. And how sweet it tastes, right? And that's the way the Word of God is. I need it. So I need to read it, but, but I like to enjoy it too. It just kind of, you know, it's sweet to my taste. So I just read it. And that's why we need to read in Psalms and Proverbs. These books are good to read every day. Some of them. You know, a little bit of Psalms every day is good. Because it helps to keep a happy heart in us. And then uh, 104, through thy precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. Somebody say, I love the Lord, but I, I still like to dance, and I like to do this, and I like to do that. Well, if God says whatever it is, is wrong. I mean, I just mentioned one thing, but there's hundreds and thousands of things that uh, are contrary to the Word of God. Why, something's not consistent there, because he said, I hate every false way. And somebody said, I love the Lord, but boy, uh, I do everything I can to cheat. Uh, having to pay my tax bill. Well, that's 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 a false way. I don't like the thing the way things are set up either about taxes. I really don't. When I think you have to, I think it's over three hours every day you have to work to pay your tax bill. I, I get kind of uh, peeved about that, but still, it's not right to lie and to cheat. You see. Uh, so we're to hate every false way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Verse one sixteen. Uphold me according unto thy word. 127, therefore I love thy commandments above gold, yea, above fine gold. And we can go on and on and on. Let's just look at one or two more. 133, order my steps in thy word. Verse 140, thy word is very pure. And, of course, clear on down through here. And one verse that I like is 160, the word, thy word is true from the beginning, and every one of thy righteous uh, judgments endureth forever. 165, great peace have they which love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Uh, 174, I have longed for thy salvation, O Lord, and thy law is my delight. And again, he said, thy law is my delight. All right, so Psalms 119, it'd be great just to read the whole chapter through and get as much as you can concerning the Word of God. And there's much of the doctrine of the Word of God right there in that one chapter. All right, now, some of the key verses to know, we notice down here, we have eight different key verses. One of them is Romans 10, 17, which says, Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by what? The Word of God. And that's right along that same context where we said, How shall they hear without a preacher? You've got to have the Word of God. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Your faith is going to be increased by, in proportion to how much of the Word of God you believe and, and hear. You've got to believe it too. Excuse me. You've got to, there has to be faith mixed with the hearing and, in order to really grow from the Word of God. And so this verse is vital to our faith. And in Hebrews 11, 6, it says, Without faith it is what? Impossible. To please God. Amen. So without faith. You see, we've got to have faith to please the Lord. And faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. All right? Now, the other verse we notice, 1 Peter 1, 23. I'd like for us to look at that one. 1 Peter 1 and verse 23. Right, uh, of course, this doctrine, we could take weeks and weeks to study on it and never, never uh, exhaust it. It's just so... So feel you know, the Holy Bible, the inspiration of the Bible. And here in 1 Peter 1, 23, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And it says in verse 25, the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. So by the gospel we preach the entire counsel of God. The word of God we're to preach to those that are round about us. Now, the Word of God, according to outline, we have it written down, is an active agent in our new birth. Now, personally, I believe, uh, and uh, we don't have a lot of time to go into this, but um, um, I personally believe it takes both the Word of God and the Holy Spirit for someone to get saved. And, and if you read John 3, 5, it talks about how that we're born of the water and of the Spirit. Now, there are different kinds of, uh, you know, different theories about what the water is there. Some believe it's the physical birth which the next verse it talks about that, which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. And then others believe the water is the, the Spirit of God because they say in the Greek it says the water even the Spirit. That pr a proposition there, a preposition can, be, uh, can also be translated even. But I, I think that to do justice to the Word of God, my own conviction is this, um, is that the water there is a type of the Word of God. And it takes both the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God to give new birth. You can't be saved with just one. It's just like we have two uh, parents physically. I believe it takes both the Word of God and the Holy Spirit of God in order for someone to get saved spiritually. Uh, and there are many scriptures that bear this out. But here we notice 
being born again. And over in John 3, Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. And some folks say, well, that term's old and out of date and now old-fashioned. And they want to call it commitment and, and this and that nowadays. But I think being born again, that just describes what it is. Better than anything else I can think of. Uh, born again. We've been born once. Now we need to be born again. I uh, need to be born from above. Born again. And then let's look at 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 5. Who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom ye believed even as the Lord gave to every man? I have planted... Now, what has is, what is he planted? What do you plant in the ground? Seed, don't you? So he said, I've planted. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And that's true even physically. If you go out here and plant some corn, uh, <laughs> you know, something might happen. Drought may come or, uh, some, or it might grow up just enough to where it, and then it hails and, and ruin it. And the only way you're going to have an increase that way is if God gives the increase through nature. And the only way we can have an increase spiritually is for sure when God gives the increase. And then, so then, neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. I'm nothing. The fellow that comes along and wins someone to Christ is nothing. God's everything. He gives the increase. Now, he that planteth and he that watereth are one. It's just as important to sow as it is to reap. Because if you don't sow, you're not going to get a reap. <laughs> Amen? You ever hear, you see anybody that, on a farm that just started praying, Lord, give me a crop this year. And he never, never thought about going out and sowing the seed. Come time to go out and, and reap it. Why, nothing's out there. He said, I don't understand it. And here comes somebody who says, I don't understand why I can't win souls. But they never sow the seed. They never go out witnessing. And yet they expect to come out on Thursday night and go out one night and win two or three people to Christ. They get discouraged if they don't get to. Uh, it takes time, doesn't it? And then it says, uh, Every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. The trouble with so many Christians is they want all the, they want all the rewards and somebody else to do all the work. Am I telling you the truth? Amen? That's the truth. It might hurt, <laughs> but it's true. And it's like a lot of folks, they want everybody to do the work, and they want to go down to welfare and get all the money. You know, I mean, get off some of the, the, uh, the rewards that everybody else worked for, paying the tax dollars for and stuff. Now, some of those people might need it, I don't know, but I know a lot of them don't. I know a lot of them are just plain lazy. And as long as they can get it free, they're going to get it free. And uh, so, but here, every man, according to... To his own labor. He's going to receive a reward according to his own labor. And uh, we're going to get about what we deserve as far as this part's concerned. We don't get what we deserve in salvation, but our rewards, we're going to get what we deserve. I mean, what we work for. And it says according to his own labor. Not, not according to someone else's, but according to his own labor. And there's many other scriptures that bring out about the seed. Mark 4, 1 through 20 is the parable of the seed and the sower. You remember how he cast the seed out, some on the wayside and, and different places, but some was on good ground that bear forth fruit. Um, and then uh, Psalms 126, 5 and 6. They that uh, sow in tears shall reap in joy. He that goeth forth weepeth and weepeth. Bearing precious seed shall doubtless come again. So we've got to bear the precious seed. Broadcast it. Uh, throw it out. Uh, so that it can fall on good ground and then bring forth some fruit. Now some of it isn't going to fall on good ground. And we're not going to reap all the time. But sometimes we're going to get to reap. And uh, sometimes I'm going to reap of someone else's work. They've sown seed. Sometimes I'm going to just sow the seed. And someone else is going to get to reap of it. But both of, us, both of them are important. They're, it's one work that we're doing. All right, now, um, let's look here. First Peter 2.2 2 is the third verse, and it says that uh, something about by the word of God, by the, the milk of the word, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. First Peter 2 and verse 2. So newborn babes will want the milk of the word. Then when you get a little older, what are you going to want? What are you going to need? Meat, right? Meat of the Word. It's just like a baby. You don't give a baby a, a, a steak. Even McDonald's. You give them milk, right? <laughs> They're not ready to chew yet until they get some teeth. And, boy, it takes growing pains to get that ready to eat meat. Man, after those teeth coming in, that just makes them sick. And sometimes they even run a temperature. Sometimes they vomit all over. Sometimes they... Well, it's miserable. And they have some growing pains. But finally they get their teeth to where they can start chewing the meat. And a lot of Christians just say they, they expect just to grow into being able to eat meat with no problem, no pains, no problems at all. But listen, that's just daydreaming. We ought to be realistic. We know there are going to be some problems, you see, until there's going to be some growing pains, right? And that's why I don't tell somebody when they come, everything's going to be a bed of roses from now on, because I'd be a liar. 
I've got to be honest with them. There's going to be some problems. But God is able to help them through those problems if they'll trust Him. Now, we see the other verses. John 17, 17, Thy word is truth. He said, Sanctify them, uh, them through Thy word. Thy word is truth. 2 Timothy 2, 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing what? The word of what? Of truth. Isn't it? Let's see. Rightly dividing the word of, is it God or truth? I'm going to look that up. Make sure. A person can think it's one thing, and then after, when he says it, it doesn't, he's not completely sure. Word of truth. Okay. So rightly dividing the word of truth. And then John 20, 30, 31 talks about how that there's so many, if all of the things that God did, if that Christ did, um, the world wouldn't contain all of those works. Um, Luke 4 and verse 4. Here's the truth. Man cannot have spiritual strength without the word. Christ is our example. Luke 11, 24 through 28. Happiness is for the man who hears the word and keeps it. And James 1, 22 talks about that, how the word to be doers of the word, not, not hearers only. 2 Peter 4, 1 and 2, Paul told Timothy, said to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine. So that's what we're to be doing. We're to be preaching the word of God. The preacher is commanded to preach the word. And we ought not to just be wasting time behind the pulpit. Preach the word. My opinion doesn't account to much. God's word accounts for everything. It's truth. It is the very word of God. And then 1 Peter, or... Uh, you might want to write down 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25, how it talks about the foolishness of preaching. 1 Corinthians 1, 18 through 25. It's by the foolishness of preaching that God has chosen to save people. Isn't that something? It seemed kind of foolish. Somebody get up behind a pulpit and raise his voice and say, man, you've got to get saved. You're going to go to hell. Uh, saying you better live for the Lord and, and uh, really uh, point his finger out there and preach it. But see... He's just simply God's messenger. It's God that's really doing the speaking. Anytime a man's preaching the Word of God, better listen to that Word, hadn't we? That's what we want to hear. The Word of God. And so he's commanded to preach the Word. And the central theme of the written Word is the living Word. Jesus Christ. John 1, 1 through 14. And we uh, studied that a little bit last Sunday. Now, is there any question um, before we're dismissed from our class? Anyone that has a question or maybe a comment to add to the lesson that might be a blessing to us? Is there anyone? All right, if not, let's all stand together and we'll be dismissed in prayer. It's good to have each one of you here today. And I trust that you'll be back next Lord's Day and that you'll bring someone with you.